we we will save that because I have a feeling this is going to be our longest episode. <laughs> okay, here we go. It's here. It's the one year hack fraud show anniversary spectacular. Yay! John. <laughs> Uh, we're all four here together again. Say hi to the nice people, uh, Garrett. Hi, I'm back. You won't see me again for a couple more months. <laughs> yeah, I I don't think we ever really explained your absence. We just kind of went on with the show and kind of... <laughs> well, for those of you that are actually curious why I disappeared... And Which why is first as soon as you yeah. listen to the podcast... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's first assume that you actually noticed that I was gone. I haven't been doing so hot in school, so I'm taking this semester off from the podcast so that I can focus on that. And then I'll be back for the next summer. Yay! Yay! Hopefully we have next out. summer. Yeah, that I I think we will be. I've got some I've got some interesting stuff uh, on the docket, but uh, we will see where that goes. Anyway, Werner's under a bit of a time constraint here, so we'll circle back around to our what we've been watching segment at the end. But uh, guys, let's uh, let's do a little navel gazing, shall we? <laughs> oh, oh, okay. All right. So this is our our forty eighth episode. Uh, co- coincidentally, uh, as I'm sure people know by now, we we crib a lot from uh, the Vidiots Video Store show, which is a great podcast that everyone should listen to. But did they not know that? Did they not know that? And he doesn't just say that because he's personal friends with the company. Well, I, I don't think kind of is a personal friend asterisk. I, I wouldn't call myself personal friends, but I, I, I have met both of the hosts and they are delightful people. But uh I the coincidentally, their one year uh special listing show was also their forty eighth regular episode. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> I guess when you do like a weekly format, that's I, I guess things even out after a while. Yeah, but... Who knows? 52 weeks. We took, like, a three-week break somewhere in the middle there. Uh, yeah, we, we have... Uh, so we have both consciously and accidentally created a discount video, it's video store show. We kind of have, but... And, I, and I'm proud of that. <laughs> you know what they say. Imitation is the best form of flattery yes we that's what we always say that's what we always say yes um you know i was just it's been a good year it's been a i think it's been a good year of the of the podcast i mean it's all right let me let me be clear it's been a horrible year but in, in terms of the podcast it's it's been pretty good it made it it i mean it did make the year pretty pretty palatable so. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, like, e- even in, like, some of, the, some of the shittiest weeks out there, I still had the podcast. <laughs> I still had, like, oh, boy, I'm going to watch some movies I'm not going to feel that great about, yeah. and I'm going to have some ru- some wild conversation about it. <laughs> yes, that's, that's, yeah, agreed. I was just going to say I, I uh, made a lengthy list of the movies we, we watched because uh, Warner wasn't sure uh, what we had and hadn't watched for the show. I counted them all. Uh, the movies that at least two of us watched, there were 96 of them. So we've watched almost 100 movies for this podcast. That astounded me when I saw it. <laughs> it was a pretty staggering list to see all together in one place. <laughs> but uh, it's been a wild year of movies, of filmmakers, and of blue dong jokes, which fortunately stopped around the halfway mark. I, but now I, you mentioned I, it, so now they're going to happen again. I think since you brought up blue dong, I think I have to do one of my many lists. I have to do an apologies list. <laughs> I will like quickly run through. <laughs> All right, Reed. What? There are only three. What do you have to there atone for? Okay, so I'm gonna go three to one. So number three, I kind of regret not seeing Paris, Texas. <laughs> no, no one's stopping you from watching it, but but go on. That's true. Uh, number two, uh, I am a little ashamed. Uh, coming in light of recent events for continuing on the Blue Dong joke. <laughs> I apologize to the listeners. 
I'm sorry. You know I'd completely forgotten those ever happened until you brought those up a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Oh, no, I, could, I couldn't forget them. I'm, I'm curious, what are the recent events that make you want to atone for those? Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and this atonement is just weird, but... And, and this dates back to the very first episode of the podcast when I talked about a pair of movies that... A Raisin you know, in the Sun. A Raisin in the Sun. And then I do apologize to the audience for saying that the Sean Combs version isn't good. It's actually decent. It's just that the original version was highly restricted by the studios who made it because they didn't want Hansberry's editions which are included in the um, combs. And uh, knowing that fact and, it, it, and acknowledging that makes me feel a lot better. Okay. So I am sorry for that viewpoint. About one year ago. I guess my apologies stem from I apologize for any just like hot, just reactionary hot takes I have had during this podcast. I apologize you... to Mr. David Fincher personally. <laughs> I apologize to the film 2001 A Space Odyssey. I apologize to Tomorrowland. <laughs> You, you, and I apologize to any other movies in the future for which I will have raging, uh, reactionary, hot take opinions of. Um, <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Since I don't have any apologies, I'm an asshole. <laughs> Since we're all apologizing for things, uh, I, I, I guess I'll apologize to the Life Aquatic, even though I don't think it's warranted. <laughs> deserves my apology, but I'm giving it anyway. Oh, uh, you're you're a bigger man than I, John. Uh, <laughs> shall we uh, shall we get to our uh, our uh, lists and our honorable mentions here? Yes. Sure. We all came up with five uh, movies for which we find as personal favorites of the of the ninety six we have seen on <laughs> yes. this podcast. And to be clear, the the rules here were. Movies we had either watched the first time for the podcast or movies that we had not watched in a long time and gained a new appreciation for. Um, a rule which I did not ultimately find to be necessary, but I'll get to that in a minute. Um, I, I find that to be a little bit necessary for me. But. I, I, I like having it as a rule. I think they those movies should not be discounted. Mm-hmm. All right, so we all have our top five. Li- Warner, did you successfully assemble a list of five? I was a little worried that you might not be... Because you, yes, I, I actually just assembled a list of five. Plus, I have one, two, three, four honorable mentions. Oh, goody! Oh, okay. Ooh, okay. All right. All right. Let's uh, let's run down the honorable mentions, I guess, and then we'll we'll Do we count. Do just want a list of and briefly explain why? Or yeah, sure. That's that's fine. You can have like a one or two sentence reason. Okay. Reed, do you want to start? Sure. Okay. So, originally I had four honorable mentions, but then looking back, and I'm like, you know what? This seems too much. So, I narrowed it down to two. To, so, one of my honorable mentions is what was a movie I saw when I was younger, absolutely despised it, and then watching it on this podcast made me realize a lot more was going on with this movie, and this was ultimately a much better movie than I remembered. Uh, of course, I'm vile. <laughs> Fuck no. It is one story of a tale of two genes. And yes, this is Singing in the Rain. Yay. Yay. Excellent movie. And then, and, then my, and then my other honorable mention is probably the best biopic I've ever seen and the best performance by a British actor I've ever seen in probably one of the more powerful films that I've also ever seen. And this is Selma. Hmm. So, yeah. Also a good movie. movie. Very good movie. Okay. All right, we're off to a good start here. John, uh, what... Okay, what do I have? Um, granted, there's a lot of movies on here that I that I could have done, like, uh, the, like The Sky Over Berlin, the other <laughs> Vim Vendors movie I really adored. Um, let's see, but, like, as far as, like, a proper list, um, Die Hard, one of the best action movies ever made, <laughs> just, just a classic. Um, 
Martin Fink, like <laughs> one of the most, one of the darkest and most fascinating musings on Hollywood, and I think one of a, a, a Coen Brothers movie that I really love. Um, Annie Hall. Oh. God, what, what, what a delightful movie. Yeah. What a delightful, smart movie. I'm surprised uh, it's taken us this long to get back to the Woody Allen well. We, we should really do that. I think I want to do husband, husbands and wives at some point. Yeah. Singing in the Rain was great. I, I, I loved, I adored Akira Kurosawa's Hidden Fortress. But I think the last one, and this is one um, that is a rediscovery for me, um, Willy Wonka and the Top of the I've watched it so much as a kid. But you know what? Just watching it for the podcast, you realize, like, God, what a great fucking movie. Yeah. What, a, what a smart, fun, well-constructed movie. In a world of podcast imagination. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's a delight. I, I could go on, but I'm going to leave it at that. All right, all right. Warner, what, uh, what have you? Okay, so these first two are actually... I was mistaken when I said I don't have any apologies. These are the two that I should apologize to, but um, I have Scott Pilgrim versus the World and The Eternal Sunshine and the Spotless Mind. Oh. If you'll remember, I hated those movies when we did podcasts. No, you loved Eternal Sunshine. You loved it. Did I? Yeah. I couldn't yeah. remember. <laughs> I thought I hated them because they made me remember some rough spots in mm. my life. But looking back on them, they gave me a certain appreciation for different genres that I necessarily venture into, and I actually really enjoy the ideas behind them. So those are two of my honorable mentions, and the other two are Superman Returns and A Few Good Men. <laughs> Yay, we have Superman Returns on here! I, I didn't expect this! Yeah, Oof. I absolutely Superman. loved those movies, but they weren't quite enough to make it into my top five, so... Mm. Superman Good. Returns is the best Superman movie and one of the best superhero movies ever made. Uh, that's your opinion. Uh, <laughs> I'm inclined to agree with him. <laughs> Uh, I, I will say this, I forgot to apologize to Edgar Wright. Oh, yes. Thank you. <laughs> I apologize, Edgar Wright. Um, and now, uh, moving on. Tyler, what's your list? All right, my honorable mentions. All right, I've got one movie that almost made my top five. I went back and forth for a really long time, but ultimately this one just didn't make it on there. Uh, that was Tim Burton's Edward Scissorhands, which, a very weird but very heartfelt movie that I really enjoyed and kind of a rediscovery for me because I'd seen it when I was a kid and been kind of traumatized by it. So <laughs> That was one that missed my, uh, just barely missed my honorable mentions. All right. I didn't see it. <laughs> uh, also, I have here uh, Star Trek IV The Voyage Home. Who <laughs> knew? <laughs> a... A delightful movie. I guess I should also apologize for telling John to fuck off uh, after saying that Star Trek was better than Star Wars, but I still maintain Empire Strikes Back is a better movie than any Star War uh, Star Trek movie, but that's my opinion. John, you have your opinion. Voyage Home is a delightful movie. I don't want to fight about it. Uh, I liked it a lot. You, you redeemed your opinion by <laughs> so, apology accepted, uh, Mr. A <laughs> <laughs> Couple more here. Uh, Akira Kurosawa's Rashomon. I recognize that this is like an empirically better movie than any of the movies in my top five, probably, but I just I just did, enjoyed my five movies more, so that's just one that didn't make it. And then, uh, just as an honorable mention, I have uh, basically the entire filmography of Hayao Miyazaki. <laughs> um, it... <laughs> Well, how many of those were, like, were, were all of them, like, outside of, like, were all of them, like, introduced to you by the podcast? Not all of them. I mean, the, all the ones we watched for the podcast, um, I had not seen before and I really enjoyed. I watched Spirited Away outside of the podcast. I watched uh, Princess Mononoke outside of the podcast. Really enjoyed both of those. I just, I had never seen a Miyazaki movie before we did our first episode uh, where we did Porco Rosso, and that was, I think, John's big goal with this podcast was to finally get me into Miyazaki, and he has succeeded. Um, and we may talk about him again 
a little bit down the line. Who knows? I only put House of Blue Castle on my on my list, mm-hmm. but I couldn't. I the first time I see it. Uh, I will say that there's another great Japanese animator called Satoshi Kon that we could dive Ooh. into at some point. Ooh. And he makes batshit crazy movies that are wonderful. <laughs> Uh, that sounds interesting. Okay. But, all right, so those Save are that for when I come back. <laughs> <laughs> those are our honorable mentions. Uh, we are the, these are all movies that we really really like. Uh, but let's get to the official canon here. Uh, Cream of the crop. Our yes. These are our top five best of the hack fraud show lists. Read. What's your number five? Okay, so my so on the top five list for hack the hack fraud show, and I'm just gonna call it volume one <laughs> of uh, fuck knows how many <laughs> series. So number five came in. It it kind of creeped in, and this was surprisingly a movie that kept my attention for the whole time. There were no breaks. It was nonstop, nonstop, almost, and. This movie was Carol Reed's Night Train to Munich. Oh, <laughs> what a delightful movie. It's a fucking pulpy blast. <laughs> it's so pulpy, but it's so fast. And there are actual fucking Nazis. <laughs> With, you what know, accidental like Nazis? Actual fucking Nazis. Actual fucking Nazis. And, which, and fake fucking Nazis. It's good. And fake fucking Nazis, yeah. yeah. Rex Harrison as a as a monocled uh, <laughs> Nazi impersonator. <laughs> oh, it's it's that's a that's a great movie. That's probably one of the funnest movies we've seen on the show. Yes, very dynamic cinematography, probably very much ahead of its time. I'd say so. Yeah, as, as far as its depiction of Nazis, yeah, that is ahead of its time. And I and I absolutely enjoyed every bit of this movie. Huzzah! John. Oh shit, it's me. Um, at number five, this was a movie with two years of build up. <laughs> two years of <laughs> It's Boogie Fucking. Oh, Night. yes. <laughs> I'm so delighted to see this on your list, John. I, yes. This is. What I, I think I think this is something we're going to see throughout my list is that I adore movies that are just an experience mm-hmm. that yes. like you remember where you were when you watched them that like the movies within themselves were an event and like this movie's depiction of the porn industry is just fascinating like it's it's surrogate family is fascinating and how it's an arc about people trying to leave the surrogate family but ultimately failing. It is just chock, and it's just got a a bunch of great performances, and just, like, the fucking, I mean, it has a lot of in in common with, like, 90s Scorsese in regards to its structure, Mm. and its filmmaking, and and why it's kind of lower on my list is because, like, the thing about P.T. Anderson is that, like, he doesn't have, you don't see the world through the eyes of his characters, you see the world from, like, this third-person perspective. Is that, like, we're kind of these omnipotent judgment, yeah. Yeah. judgment calls. And, like, that's just, and that's just really, and whilst that's not as as emotionally engaging, that's still just fascinating to watch. And P.T. Anderson's just a fascinating filmmaker, and I'd argue this is some of his best work. Yeah, I, I love this movie. Uh, one of my favorite movies of all time. I told John to watch this movie for a solid two years. He had a reminder on his phone telling him to watch it, and, and he ignored them until we did the podcast. Yes, yeah, yeah. and I'm I'm so glad it it lived up to the hype. I'm yeah, I'm, I'm 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 this so movie's glad. Movie's also on my list as well. <laughs> yeah, like and we, like yeah, I remember just about every part of this movie. It's it, it's an experience, man. It's a ride. Um. Let's see, who's next? Warner. All right, my number five was Lethal Weapon. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. All you'll, right. you'll notice my, my movies, Lethal Weapon excluded, are typically ones that we didn't necessarily find were cinematic masterpieces or stuff like that. Most of these guys just might not even have enjoyed some of them, but they're ones that I found fun. And that's something that I look for more than I look for 
cinematography or good scripts. I look for something fun. So the, the fun factor is a valid concern with movies. Like we, yeah. these things are still entertainment. And, and, and remember, Warner, even love can be a <laughs> lethal weapon. <laughs> <laughs> You can love and become. I love Lethal Weapon, so that's my number five. It's, right. a, it's uh, a good movie. Yeah, that's that's just uh, I have I have some third act issues with that movie, but like performances are great. It's got all the Shane Black isms, and I like the Shane Black isms. So yeah, I really like Lethal Weapon. I guess. It's me now. All right. So my number five, I, de- oh. I debated on for a long time. It was between the movie that made it and Edward Scissorhands. I really went back and forth. But in the end, I just I think this movie is maybe just a bit better constructed. It's still got some problems. But my number five is Rob Reiner and Aaron Sorkin's A Few Good Men. Huh. I, I didn't expect this. Um so you placed it a little bit higher than I did. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, it's I'm... It is a great movie. Uh, I'm a sucker for courtroom dramas. I think that's... <laughs> I think that's part of the reason I'm so fascinated by the O.J. Simpson case. Like, it's like yep. the ultimate real-life courtroom drama. Um, and A Few Good Men is the courtroom movie. A Few Good Men is a great courtroom movie. The sequences in the courtroom are uh, fantastic, I think. You know, I have some problems with it. A lot of it kind of doesn't make a lot of sense. I'm not the world's biggest Jack Nicholson fan, and a lot of this movie kind of hinges on on Jack Nicholson's performance, but his last speech is a lot of fun. Tom Cruise, I'm just going to say it, I love Tom Cruise. I, I just Not just in this movie, I, I love Tom Cruise. All Scientology aside, I think he's a great actor. He's he is a great actor. one of my favorite performers, and... You know, the, this I, I I do enjoy Aaron Sorkin, not as much as I used to think I did, but The West Wing is great, and The Social Network is probably my favorite movie ever, um, and he, he's uh, got some very good, like, embryonic form things going on here, so that's my number five, A Few Good Men. I, I will say, like, one of the things I've gotten out of this podcast is, you know, I do like Aaron Sorkin. And in a good few men, in a few good men, I, I get to see Jack Nicholson devour scenery whole, <laughs> and I will pay money for any movie where that happens. What, what is so? Who wants to start off with their number four? I guess I'll start. Oh, oh we're bouncing. Okay. Um, my number four was The World's End. Ah, I loved that movie. I also I really like this movie. The ending was. Bit anticlimactic in my opinion. Yeah. But yeah. overall, yeah. it was phenomenal. It was, in my opinion, one of the perfect balances of the things that Tyler and John Reed look for and what I look for. So. And that's your right movie with a It was. No! <laughs> All right. Keep it, keep it in your. Uh, keep... I'm keeping it in the holster. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, I I really like the world's end. Uh, I'm glad it's on your on somebody's list, Warner. Uh, Edgar Wright week was kind of a. Uh, I listened to that episode yesterday, and boy, <laughs> John really brought a gun to a knife fight on that one. But uh, it's it's a lot of fun. It's got some good filmmaking, like like I, like the montage of them at in the bars and like the. And the use of them drinking is a lot of fun and creative. So, but those are those are bad. Ones. Next. Okay, I guess I'll go. Okay, so my number four list was among one of the first movies we saw on on this podcast, and it was a Michael Keaton filled movie with <laughs> pigs. Oh, Michael Keaton! It's <laughs> Brooks on Michael Keaton as an as an anthropomorphic pig in well of course in animation form uh right through planes in the adriatic sea and of yes of course i'm talking about hayao miyazaki's porco rosso <laughs> the first miyazaki movie i i have ever seen and damn it's a gorgeous movie <laughs> miyazaki is a goddamn master like I, I don't think there's a better filmmaker out there and it's 
it, it's it's this is one of his more go- this is one of his goofier movies, and it's also one that has some. This might be his most somber character. Like, yeah, it's it's really interesting. Yeah, this is definitely um Porco Rosso is definitely a character who sort of pays the price in a way, and then just has just has to live life as as a pig. And finding pirates, nice pirates, mind you, <laughs> nice pirates. Nice pirates that they say that say things like, "Do we have to take all fifteen of them?" Yeah, I don't want them to be separated from their friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a delightful movie. The voice acting in it um, is is excellent. Uh, I also really like that movie. Oh, oh God, am I am I next? Oh yes, you're next. Yes. Oh no. Um, my number four is like, this is something that missed the list originally, but then I saw like I know I ha- I have to have I-, I think I need to put this on there just for the sake of like this is probably one of the more important movies that I saw for this podcast, mm. and that's No Country for Old Men. Ah, no, like I hadn't seen this before, and God damn it, I'm so glad I did. I think. It's the Coen Brothers masterpiece because I, I knew I had like the Coen Brothers week. I think was one of the better weeks we've had, and I, I yeah. tried to put a Coen Brothers movie somewhere on this list. And No Country for Old Men, God damn it, it has some of the best filmmaking. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just period. Yeah, it's it's an incredible <laughs> movie. Like its musings on Texas are just like fat. I like I love the Coen Brothers vision of the American South. I love its musings on crime. I, I, I love Shigur is just such an interesting character, yeah. and how this and how this world reacts to Shigur is just so interesting. So yeah, it is again. This is just another movie where it's like you remember where you were when you saw it. It in itself is an experience. Yeah, and you and it just puts you in. It just lulls you into its world, and I. I, I, I will never be able to say enough about this movie yeah, other than just go out and fucking see it, you hack of goddamn frauds. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I just have to um, say this. Yesterday I was re- – the Washington Post uh, did a fun little article where they uh, had their film critics uh, like reassess the best picture winners from like the last 40 years and point out uh, – uh which ones deserved it and which ones didn't. And for some reason, they both would have picked something besides No Country for Old Men. I was like, are you people insane? No Country for Old Men is one of the best movies ever and one of the best movies ever to win Best Picture. So It is one of the best uses of the cinematic form out there. Yeah. And like, I can, there are movies I love more, but like, it's no, you can teach a class on No Country for Old Men. It's astounding. And, and yeah, I think it's just something to be marveled at. And here it is. I am marveling at it. At yes. Four. Yes. All right. My number four is a was a late breaking entry. Uh, we've talked about it already. It's a night train to Munich. <laughs> <laughs> I just enjoyed the hell out of this movie. It is so much fun. It is a blast. I was just riotously entertained the entire time. It's pulpy, sure, but I just enjoyed the fuck out of this movie. <laughs> it's, it's pulpy in just a really fun way. That's, yeah. It's not pulpy in an annoying way. Like, it, it's also like, Carol Reed is such a great filmmaker in that we can juggle monocled fake Nazis with actual goddamn concentration camp. Yeah. And I, that's just a testament of filmmaking. It just... And also, and, and also model ca- concentration camps as well, which... <laughs> Nice it's got such a great balance, this movie. And just wonderful characters. Yeah, wonderful characters. Those two British guys who are uh, upset about missing the cricket season lo- and losing their golf. Those are two characters that will stick out in my mind forever. What a movie. I'm so glad we saw it. Also, one of the last movies I rented from uh, from Vidiots before their store oh. closed down. And it's it's a fantastic movie. Uh, Warner, you should see this movie. I think you'd really enjoy it. Yeah. Like, goddamn it, the fucking scene where they sit, where they're told that World War II was started, and they just sit down and say, "Huh, I won't be able to get my golf clubs in Berlin." <laughs> and that's just a fucking great moment. Oh goodness, we're on to number three. Number three already. I think John should start this one. <laughs> oh boy. Oh, uh, okay. Number three was. This is another movie where, I, when I was making my like initial list, I forgot this movie, and then I realized, like, oh wait a minute, 
I'd rather cut my leg off than leave this movie out. It's Steven Spielberg's E.T. <laughs> <laughs> yes. A delight. This is, this is another, like, I, I, I love atmosphere in movies. Like, I love it when movies just suck you into their world. Like, I, I adore, like, there, this is a movie that captures that sense of discovery. That sense, like, you're learning something new. And he captures it in such an authentic and fascinating way. Yeah. And like, and also, like, it's it's a kind of straightforward science fiction movie insofar as its depictions of the alien and how people react to it. But the tone of it is so fantastical and so ethereal. Mm-hmm. And like, the connection between Elliot and ET is just fascinating and just heartwarming. Like this is this is another sort of it's both a, a fam a, a regular family movie and a surrogate family movie. Yeah. With E.T. coming in. And like, god damn it, this has some of Spielberg's best imagery. Like the fucking image. Like the way he uses the moon yeah. in this movie. It's just what well, not just like the iconic image, but just throughout the movie. Mm. It's just fascinating. Like, the way he sh- he's shooting from the child's perspective, that just creates some jaw dropping compositions. It is just a masterpiece of uh, both a boy and his dog story and a, and a sci-fi film. Yeah. And yeah, it, it's an ex- again, this is another movie that's like, I remember where I saw it. I remember what mood I was in. I remember what I felt when I saw it. And like, <laughs> this is one of the movies that like on like a personal level just hit me the most. And it made, it was the closest movie to make me cry. On, on, in, on this podcast, and I'll give it everything in the world for that. Yeah, I I first saw this movie when I was uh, about seven years old. Freaked me the fuck out. I didn't want to see it for years and years afterwards. I finally not re- unlike Edward Scissorhands. Not unlike it. It was a very similar experience actually. And then I finally rewatched it. Um, I didn't re I rewatched it before we rewatched it for the podcast, and that uh, otherwise it probably would have ended up on my list too. But I rewatched it toward uh, last year, finally, and it's an incredible movie. It's just, it's perfect. I oh my God, the scene where E.T. is dying is <laughs> that is just a masterpiece of filmmaking. It's yeah. E.T. I, I I could say more, but I do not. Ah uh, yes, no. E.T. I still can't believe Warner didn't like it. Uh, <laughs> no. Guns like away! Guns away! Guns away! Okay, Guns all away. right. Next, read. What have you? All right. So my top three movies from here on out are movies that have either been sort of fed with have been sort of fed with anticipation, mm. either from me or from other people. For number three, Tyler, you have been sort of saying you need to watch this movie. You need to watch this movie. Oh my god! Oh my god! It's so good. And um, and when we finally got around to watching this movie for the podcast. I was blown away. I was also blown to tears, but I was also blown away. <laughs> um, this is this is honestly one of, the, one of the more fascinating concepts and one of the more fascinating writing. It definitely plays with all these emotions, with with circumstance and happenstance, and this is probably one of the best Jim Carrey movies I've seen. <laughs> and uh, this this movie, um, of course, is Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Yay. Number three. A a great movie. I, one of my one of my top five favorite movies of all time. Uh, wow, I, I'm tearing up just thinking about it. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm right there with you. It's it's Charlie Kaufman's masterpiece. Charlie Kaufman's a great filmmaker, and this is the best film. I can't really say more than that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's really really good. It's well done. Yeah. Well, honestly, just sort of my, I, 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 the only reason it's not on my list is because I'd seen it before. Yeah. Um, but like, Warner, you were talking about like how like the movie just sort of transports you to your own experiences and your own relationships. Yeah. yeah. And, like, and it, 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 so, it, it is so universal, yet so oddly specific. It is mm. just like a, one of the best documents of just a relationship mm-hmm. out there. If you've ever had a good relationship turn bad you will relate to this movie. Yeah. Yeah, it's... It, it, it's and it will be painful, thing. but it will be good. Yeah, and, and, and the movie yeah. treats it with, in such a fascinating way, so I, I am so glad it's it's on your list, uh, Reed. Yes, and uh, the uh, thematic sort of sympathies with that. 
make this movie even more enjoyable and, and, and even more sort of powerful in that way. Totally agree. Three. Totally agree. All right. Uh, is that all we have to say about that one? Yes. Because if so. so, I'll jump in. Mine, my number three, and I feel like this might get some hate, <laughs> was tomorrow. No, you know what? Gun, guns away. Yo, I like Tomorrowland. <laughs> it, it was just enjoyable. It was fun. It was... I have always been and always will be a decently sized optimist for a sci-fi future. And the way they pushed it showed just how easily it can go bad, but just how easily it can go well as well. And I really enjoyed it. And uh, unless you guys have any comments on that, I'm going to take a quick run to the restroom. I'll be right back. Okay. <laughs> Look, tomorrow, tomorrow land. Okay, John. Okay. Uh, I, it's it's not a good movie. <laughs> but I enjoy it. I... That, that, like, middle third of the movie where they're kind of on the run and kind of on, like, a, a fun little caper, I just I just enjoy that a lot. Um, does it work, ultimately? No. Uh, but yeah, I'm not going to bash... Warner's not here to defend it. I'm not going to bash it. It's got, it's got a great filmmaker behind the helm, so there's some good filmmaking in there. And, it's, and, and I'm not going to deny that it has some good ideas here in like it's and it's and I like the idea of its vision of like this 1950s futurist mm. world. I like. I, I don't think that comes to pass very well, but that's an interesting idea. Yeah. If there's nothing else to be said on this movie, I have something to say about this movie, and it's more of, of an apology to the listeners as well as to you guys. <laughs> um, I have to confess that with this movie, I saw the first 20 minutes and the last 20 minutes. <laughs> You just get 20 minutes in and said, oh no, this is garbage, and then skip to the last 20 minutes. Yes. <laughs> oh my god. Read! I haven't even done that! <laughs> Alright, that's, that's, it means well. That's all we need to say. It does, it does. Sure. And it's, yes. and it is, and it is more, I, I, I will say it is far more entertaining than some other movies we've seen on this podcast. That is true. Alright. So my number three, so we're kind of approaching the, the portion of my list where I just think all of these movies are just like perfectly constructed movies. So my number three is a movie that I'd heard recommendations from, from the Vidiots show for a while. Um, and I'm so glad we watched it because it was just one of the best movie going experiences I've ever had. This is Vim Vender's Paris, Texas. What a movie! This is this is another experience movie. Like Harry Dean Stanton starring, uh, just giving an incredible performance. He does every kind of acting in this movie. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's the, it, it is the kind of performance that should win Oscars, yet doesn't. Somehow, this movie just was not nominated for any Oscars. It seems to have slipped under the radar, slipped through the cracks for a while, but. I hope it is rediscovered and reappraised soon because it's an incredible movie. The fucking scene at the end where he's talking to his wife. Yeah. And like just the fucking filmmaking <laughs> in that scene is just something I'll never forget. Like I, I will I will always remember how it's staged, how it's lit, how it's composed. Like, yeah, that's just, uh, I, I think I, I, I prefer Vim Vendors, this guy over Berlin, a little bit more, but, like, Paris, Texas is just a feat of filmmaking, and, and, and just a feat on all fronts, to be yeah. honest. Yeah, yeah. The desert landscapes and the score and the performances, and, you know, this movie's, like, two hours, 20 minutes long. It's one of the longer movies we watch for this show. I went into it, I was like, oof, oh boy, here we go, but I was hypnotized from beginning to end. It's incredible. It feels like it's 90 minutes. Yeah. Like it's in like in the best way. All right, number twos. Who's up first? I'll go again. Okay. So this movie is one movie that I had been wanting to see for a good amount of a year, maybe a little, probably a little less. Uh, I first saw this movie. I, I I first saw the trailer of this movie, and I thought, 
damn. Damn, that looks so good. In terms of cinematography, of course. And uh, and, and this is definitely probably one of the more contentious <laughs> movies on this podcast, but I will stick by it. Um, and when I first saw that, that, I didn't really know what to expect other than other than what I've heard. And then when I walked out, it was I, I was met with with two voices my own going, "Wow, what a film!" And then another going, rrr, 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 rrr. and then <laughs> I think I know what movie gorgeous, this is. Oh no, it's, it's somewhat simple, <laughs> which is why it's only at number two. And um, this is <laughs> John Carrey. This is uh, Damien Chazelle's movie, La La Land. I'm not throwing fire on you, Reed. I like La La Land a lot. I think a lot of the backlash on it is kind of bullshit. Um, and I kind of do too. I'm glad. I'm glad you liked it, and I liked it too. Yeah. Well, the, well, the reason why it's why it's not number one is because it's pretty thematically shallow, which which I will definitely admit. But the score is nice, and Emma Stone is. Probably now one of my favorite. It's probably now my favorite actress. Hmm. Interesting. Um, just, just just because I saw that movie. So, John. No, no, no. I, I, I'm not. I'm not putting, pulling out the gun. Um, the filmmaking's unbelievable. Some of the the, the choreography is great. Um, I love the color scheme. Um, Emma Stone is great, and the music is wonderful. And that's all I'll say. <laughs> and also, why it's at number two? Because Ryan Gosling cannot sing. <laughs> but regardless, he tries. He tries. He tries. He's doing his damnedest. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, uh, Ryan Gosling isn't my issue. Though. Yeah. I'm just. I was just kind of shocked by how quickly you turned on this movie, John. You know, when we you saw it twice, once with me and once with Reed. When we walked out, you you seemed to be riding pretty high on it, and then. Yeah, I was, I was Riding really high on it. We I don't know. we did the podcast like the next day, and you were like. Granted, the cat I had had for sixteen years died the day I saw uh, the land again. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say it was it was completely out of the blue. All right. Oh shit! It's my turn. My turn. Sure. Okay. At number two. Um. I I think that I I'd argue like we've pretty been pretty straightforward that we don't exactly think that all the movies on our list are the greatest films we've mm. seen. It's just these are films that have impacted us. Yes. In a way, but I think this is one for me that, like, it, I think I, I, I feel oddly personal to it, yet, like, it, despite it being the kind of movie that it is, but like, I find it just like undeniably fascinating, and its musings on society at large are just wonderful. Uh, Stanley Kubrick's A Clockwork Orange. Ah. It, it, it's an odd movie to have such uh, an, an enamorment, uh, be so enamored by because of just the sheer content of it, but like, Alex is such a fascinating character. Like, the, how the movie portrays being molded by society is fascinating. Its 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 musings on how we perceive sex are fascinating. The idea of like how we both treat criminals and ex criminals mm -hmm. in the same breath is just utterly fascinating. I think I think it's some of Kubrick's best work. It, it's oddly funny and expressionist. Like, like we, we, I remember, like when we watched it, we were at, we were oddly laughing throughout most of it. <laughs> like, there's, there's, there's quite a bit of subtle things in it, and like the image of Alex with the metal in his eyes being forced to watch atrocities is just like one of the most iconic images of all time, yeah. and an image I will never forget. And I, I think this is just a fascinating, fascinating movie, and it's out of all the movies I've seen for the podcast, this is the one I think about. Hmm. Yeah. This is the one that occupies my the most. It's bizarre, it's brutal, it's very, very troubling at times, it's yes. fascinating, and it's great. I, I like it a lot. Yeah. But troubling, but also oddly entertaining. Yeah. We it's a weird movie at that, but like I, I wouldn't I'd watch it at any time. I think she's not really fascinating. <laughs> okay. I can agree it's fascinating, and you do raise some good points, but I will never like that movie. <laughs> oh, no, no, and you don't have to. I don't, I don't blame you. Like, it's not for everybody. I, yeah, and, like, if you were to... I, I, I don't even think, like, the criticisms that it's misogynist are exactly even without merit. I think 
the criticisms logged against that movie, I think do do have val do have value, and I think like any movie, no matter what stature it has, should be dis- should be debated, should be discussed constantly. We shouldn't just like put things up on the wall and say we can never take them down. And and I will be perfectly willing to be on the defense for this movie going forward. Grant and I don't really have anything to say because I kind of boycotted this movie after <laughs> hearing about its notorious reputation of like you know what maybe some other time <laughs> in the future. There would probably be a couple scenarios where, where like I'd be compelled to, to watch and say sure, but, but unfortunately for the podcast, this wasn't one of them. It, it, it's not a nice movie, but it's an but it's an entertaining movie. It's kind of, if I can say anything as far as like its pure entertainment value and like all of its themes and regarding society are just utterly fascinating, and it has some scenes that you'll just never forget. Yeah. I guess it'd be another Tony Erdman for you. There's like this weird movie that you'll never be able to get from your brain. Oh boy. All right, Warner. Number two. Okay. Um, oh yeah. You guys are probably surprised that I haven't put one of these on here yet. The Star Trek Beyond. Okay. 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 Oh, nice. Nice. <laughs> nice. Do tell. We all went and saw this together, if I'm not mistaken. That, we did. that is correct. Yes, we did. Mm-hmm. I couldn't we remember if it was all of us that went to see it together or just a couple of us. Um, no, it was we all us. saw it for the podcast. We all saw it, did the podcast immediately afterwards. Whether that was the best move, uncertain. But <laughs> tell us why you like it, Warner. It was a move. I, John has raised a couple of good points when talking about Star Trek in the past. And I think it was John that said it primarily focuses on the ship, like stuff happening on the ship. And I really enjoyed that they took away the ship for a lot of the movie and you actually got to see the characters and how they function without all of the high tech stuff Mm. to help them at every second. I really enjoyed seeing the ingenuity and the other sides of some of these characters. And honestly, as much as it hurt, the way they destroyed the Enterprise was gorgeous. (laughs) It physically pained me. It was such a wonderful way to do it. And then, if you're familiar with some of the lore of the universe, throwing in the Franklin was a really cool touch. So, yeah, yeah. For me, it was about 50-50, liking it for nostalgia's sake and liking it for actual logical reasons. <laughs> but it still takes my number two spot. I, I like this movie. You know, Warner, you're, you're a lifelong Star Trek fan. I'm not going to begrudge you that. Um, I enjoyed it. It's a fun movie. And it's also the only Star Trek movie you hadn't seen before, so it was the only one that can, could have gone on your list. So, <laughs> you know, I think I, I've been I've grown a fondness for Star Trek. Granted, like I love it when it's in like full space submarine mode, and they're all trapped on the Enterprise. Those are my favorite, like those are my favorite episodes of the show, and so forth. But like in in regards to like. I think my issues with Star Trek Beyond just sort of stem from, like, how, like, typical... Like, it has, like, flashes of Star Trek, but just... I, I, I'm just sort of disheartened by just how typical blockbuster it is at times. But, like, the visuals can be nice. Like, it's still, it still... It still has, like... It's, still, it's got a great color scheme. I, I kind of love this franchise vision of, like, of the future by a way of the 60s. <laughs> So like it, 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 it's it's one it's probably one of the better blockbusters of the, of the last year. Yeah, I have to say this out of the um, Star Trek episode that we did earlier in the year. This was my favorite of the new Star Treks. I don't think uh, I'm really ashamed to say that. <laughs> I have no shame, of John. The two that you saw <laughs> of the well, I also saw the first one. Oh yeah. It's well, a... Into Darkness is objectively garbage. <laughs> But we still enjoy it. I still, I still have a fondness for it, oddly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, and the Star Trek Beyond definitely has some really good moments. I'd agree. And then as well as, you know, Simon Pegg, not too bad a job, also. <laughs> Just give Bones his own movie. 
I the dynamic between Bones and Spock. I would watch. In this movie. I would watch the shit out of a Bones movie. Uh, <laughs> yeah, just, just do like Clay Keller's like, like, like house in space. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. So my number two. So as I said before, the filmography of Hayao Miyazaki has been my big discovery with this podcast, and. I would definitely be remiss if I didn't put at least one of his movies on this list. Uh, but this was a movie I really, really enjoyed. It kind of snuck up on me. I wasn't totally expecting to like it based on what John had said about it. But I think it's my favorite of his that I've seen anyway. I just loved it a lot. This is Howl's Moving Castle. <laughs> yes! Victory! I, I thought it's the wind rises for a second. <laughs> for everyone that I have talked to. It is between Howl's Moving Castle and Spirited Away for which one is the best. Really? Because I have perceived that this is one of his least beloved movies. I won't, I, won't, I think Ponyo's that. Um, okay. But yeah. yeah. Ponyo's so the one that the most, nobody talks about here. Yeah. Insofar as the most country... I said Ponyo's the one that is the only one I haven't seen. Insofar as the ones that are the most controversial, I think it, this is by far the one. Yeah. I mean, I have a friend who... Like, Spirited Away is, like, her favorite movie ever, and she hates this movie. And I just don't get it. It's so... I loved it. And it, it's a great portrait of a surrogate family. It's yep. got some wildly inventive visuals. A great heartwarming story. I uh, The voice acting is so interesting. You've got yep. Billy Crystal. You've got Christian Bale. Even Emily Mortimer doing something interesting, and then the older actress who voices her when she's an old lady. I can't remember her name. but yeah, like Richard Simmons is her name. Or yeah, name. something like that. Um, or, Gene, or Gene Simmons. Gene Simmons, yes, yes, yes. Um, it, I just loved it. I, 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 I really can't explain it. This movie really just touched me in a weird way. And, yeah. <laughs> God damn it. I, I mean, it's... This is a movie that has, like, it, it is a plethora of ideas, this movie. And all of them are just so creatively and gorgeously rendered. Like, the world they construct is just something, I, I just want to dive into this world and live there. Like, it never feels like it has to explain itself, yet it has, like, such a rich uh, apparent lore it's all, all the characters are just wonderful and warm and even besides all of its all of its dangling plot threads it'll find just a time for Sophie just to get a chair and sit by the sea <laughs> and look at the gorgeous landscape painted I just this is yeah. one of my favorite movies yep. I, I think I think it has to be some of Miyazaki's best stuff in it I'll always love it I, I don't come to Miyazaki movies for the plot. They are just experiences to be had, and this one was my personal favorite of those. Yeah, it is a the fucking experience. Yeah, I, I'm so glad it's. I'm so glad you <laughs> loved it as much as you did. I was really. I, I thought when when we signed that, I thought we'd get it into we'd get into some like SmackDown drag out fight over it, <laughs> and that and we didn't. And we I'm did really not. happy about that. Yeah. The. Miyazaki Week was one of my favorite episodes that we've done, I think. Yeah, same here. All right. Yeah. Oh, no. We've arrived. It's time for our number one picks. All right. I'm, I would like to start this off just okay. because, one, I don't know how much longer I have yeah. that I can actually be here, but two, I feel like we might have a decent amount of discussion about the one I'm about to say. All right. And some of you might not believe me that this is the first time I've seen this, but my number one pick for this year was Batman Mask of the Phantasm. (laughs) 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 You know, I could. That's a great Batman movie. It is a great Batman movie. That is a great Batman 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 movie with a great visual style. Um. The style is great. It gives you the back everything you need to know, without feeling like it's dragging you down with the same repetitive backstory that yeah. you get in every Batman film, yeah, and in every Batman series at least five times. 
it feels no need to explain itself, even despite it being a kid's movie. And that's... It feels no need to explain itself, but it still explains itself. But you don't question why or feel like it's shoved in your face. It makes sense how it's done. It brings up a lot of... It makes you think about the world that they live in. And I adored it. And it, it's between that one and Under the Red Hood for which one is my favorite Batman movie. I, I think you could you can make... I, I make the argument that like Mask of the Phantasm is the most perfect of the Batman movies. Because like there's like the Christopher Nolan stuff and the Tim Burton stuff and all and all that and and, I, and you can argue those have more compelling parts. But I think just as a complete whole, Mask of the Phantasm cohesives better than those others. <laughs> it it comes together as a solid single piece. You no. don't need sequels to help explain things. You don't need anything else. Yep. It works by itself, and it has a genuinely good mystery. Yeah, it really does, and, and one of the better villains. You and one of the better villains we have, and, and all that, all that plus the Joker for the price of admission. Oh, yeah. And, and, yeah, was about to say, and you get really Mark really Hamill as the Joker, and Mark Hamill is arguably one of the best incarnations of the Joker ever. Like, yeah, I think that's. I, I really love Batman, Batman: Mask of the Phantasm. I'm really, I'm really glad. I forgot we saw it for a second. <laughs> I, I forgot that was a movie. I it's, thought that was like an hour-long TV special. It's barely it was, a movie. It was an actual movie. It's, it was an actual well, movie. And it was released and, in theaters, but only for like a week in 1993, because <laughs> like no one gave it proper marketing. And I'm actually kind of ashamed that I didn't even put it on my short list. <laughs> I'm kind of ashamed. You know, I it's barely a movie, but it is a movie, and I, I appreciate it a lot. And I like Batman, uh, Dark Knight is my favorite Batman movie, just you know, because I I just love it. Um, it's a very basic choice, but Warner, I'm glad I'm glad you picked this one. It's it's a lot of fun. It's got some very interesting things going on. It's a lot more like complex than it has any right to be, and yeah. it's a lot more complex than you even think it is unless yeah. you're actually watching it to analyze. Yeah. <laughs> That's, it's kind of a disruptive movie. It's when you're like, oh, it's it's like this uh, hour hour and fifteen long TV special they threw on cinema screens. How good can it be? Blah blah blah. But you, it's a movie. Good good pick. Good pick. Good job. See, I make good choices when it comes to movies once in a while. <laughs> we're, we're proud of we're proud of you, Warner. Good. Yes. I was actually kind of surprised with how little hate I got from my list. <laughs> I kind of thought a lot of you guys were going to be. About some of them. We're trying to be conciliatory um, today. Yes, <laughs> we we've already unleashed our barbs against all these movies in, in the past, and like I see no reason to pull out my gun again. Never, never let anyone tell you uh, you're wrong for liking the things you like. Yes, yes, yes. I think that that's like one of the biggest things I've learned from this podcast is that there are no film maxims. Yeah. There are no film maxims. Only good and only good and bad filmmakers. I guess. John, what's your uh, what's your number your number one there? Oh, what's my number one? Um, Odd Man Out. Ah, uh, of course. <laughs> I think it's just the fucking atmosphere of it, and like the the, the world of Belfast in this movie is something that's just so beautifully rendered in black and white and just so fascinating to watch like the like the, the conflict between the IRA and this and this community and how the, this community reacts to Johnny like all the characters are just so even if they're if, even if they have just such so uh, a relatively small amount of screen time they just seem so alive like the nurses like the, the mad painter who wants to paint Johnny <laughs> And, and, and like all, all the members of the organization, it is such a fully rendered world. And like, I think like the, the biggest reason that like this is at number one is that like, I mean, one of my favorite movies of all time is The Third Man. Yeah. And like, that's one of the that's one of like the core pillars of my initial film studies initiation. And like this, this movie took me right back to not only when watching watching the Third Man, but like when I watched Kane for the second time and saw all the nuances in it, 
it, it took me right back to the kind of movies that got me into this. It, it got me. It, it, it got me back to what I felt when I first watched Miyazaki and other and other filmmakers. I re- when I watched more Wells movies, like movies that got me to where I am today. This just took me right back to those, and I I can't give bigger uh, better praise for for a movie that made me feel that. Yeah, and also like just goddamn the filmmaking. <laughs> it's incredible. Goddamn it's the fucking filmmaking. It's such a pillar. It's it's an unbelievably rich movie. Mm-hmm. Such and a, it's just a tragedy that it's not as well known as it should be. Yeah, such a full world and such a full meal. Uh, it's great. Mm-hmm. It's great. All the characters are wonderful. The sets are wonderful. Like, God damn it, this has some of the best black and white cinematography you'll see. <laughs> and and I, and I love black and white cinematography just as a, as a maxim. So I, I I can't really say too much more other than like, God damn it, what a fucking movie. what a fucking movie. What a fucking movie. What a fucking movie. All right, Dr. Reed. Okay, so this movie has a somewhat history of anticipation, but I'll get to that later. So this was a movie. When I first saw it, I didn't really want to watch it because this was one of our longest movies on mm-hmm. this podcast, and this was al- and this was already mentioned, by the way. Yes. Um, this has a very much of, I'm going to call it a mockumentary, as opposed to a documentary of this more of a mockumentary style. And it started as a mockumentary. What? If we know what you're talking about, it was originally made as a mockumentary. That's what I thought, yeah. It's, well, well damn it, there's no more, <laughs> there's no more surprise. <laughs> but, okay. This was probably the most well-concise movie I've ever seen. This caught my attention from the very beginning. I mean, this is also a phallic movie, and, and well, damn, we already know. So, well, so let me just get to the history of, of this movie. This is the movie um, that uh, Tyler recommended to John and I after we saw Spotlight several years back and said, John, you need to watch this movie. And when we finally did this on the podcast, I'm like, I kind of don't want to do this movie. I'm like, I kind of, but when I got done with it, I'm like, wow, wow, hot damn. And uh, this movie, of course, is Paul Thomas Anderson's Boogie Nights. Yes. I'm so glad, Reed. I'm, I'm, I'm so, I'm so glad you love this movie as much as you do. <laughs> I, I am too. Like, it's... This is a movie that you just can't forget. There's no way you can forget this movie. Like, the fucking scene where they're shooting the po- they're shooting porn, then they cut to inside the camera, <laughs> and the porn runs out. Like, I'll never forget that image. I will agree there is a lot of good stuff in this movie, but I can't enjoy this movie. <laughs> Which is weird when you think about who I am. <laughs> but... This, this is also it's weird not a for me. Movie. It's a movie about porn. Yeah. This is a weird movie because for me as well, because because I think the general trend is like liking this movie is also beyond, um, also liking uh, Clockwork Orange. But then again, I never saw it. Never want to actually. But this is a, but this is a generally fascinating movie, and it goes and it jumps through all these social conventions, it, especially with with just hallmarks of the porn industry and how people are treated after porn, before porn. Oh, what's his name? The camera guy. Little Billy? A little Bill. Oh, the yeah. Is, is that the, yeah, is that yeah. the guy who keep, whose wife keeps getting fucked? Yeah, William H. Uh-huh. Macy, yeah. Yeah. Reed, I will say this, is that in Boogie Nights, all the sex is consensual, whereas in A Clockwork Orange, half of it's rape. Mm. So that's... I thought all of it was rape. Uh, not all... There, there, I think there's one consensual sex scene. <laughs> one. Uh, one. Like, one. Twelve. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, but Boogie Nights, such a feast of a movie. It's it's such a rich ensemble piece. I adore it. It's it's just, it's incredible. And Reed, I'm so glad you liked it. John, I'm so glad you liked it. Warner, I'm so sorry you didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. 
Do you do you have anything else to say about this read? I, I don't want to cut you off of your your raves about about Boogie Nights. This is probably the only movie I like more Mark Wahlberg in, also. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure that Dong at the end is fake. So. <laughs> it it <laughs> is. I, I want I want to believe. No. I also I also want to. All right, believe. guys. Sorry about this, but I gotta go. All right, so. I'll text you my number one word. <laughs> See you guys later. All right. Bye. 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 Okay. All right. So here we are. My number one. All right. All right. All right. My number one may surprise you. Um, you you guys know as well as anyone that I'm kind of a snob. Yeah. I'm kind of. Are you assuming that I'm not a snob? <laughs> I'm not a snob in that, that statement. I can be kind of high and mighty with my movie choices sometimes. I enjoy, um, you know, some very artistic movies. There's some of those on my list, like Paris, Texas. But my number one, I just went with, you know, I think it's a perfect movie. It's so well-constructed. It's a rollicking good time. I just enjoyed the hell out of it. I, I, It was unbelievable how much I enjoyed this movie. My movie, my number one pick is John McTiernan's Die Hard. <laughs> it's a perfect movie. It it's is a so perfect like, movie. I, like, if you tell me what's the problem with Die Hard, I'm just like, uh, maybe it's too well constructed. I don't fucking know. Like, the performances are magnificent. Like, the villains are great. Um, John McClane is a great is a great character. The, the fucking tower that they're in is just such a great set. Piece. What an incredible set. What an incredible yeah. setting. Reed has what slid out of the frame. <laughs> to quote Red Letter Media, fuck movies. <laughs> <laughs> did, did, Reed, did you see Die Hard or not? Oh. oh. You're, you're missing out, man. You're yeah. missing out. It, this this movie's great. Well, an incredible, just one of the best action movies ever made. Yeah. So incredible in the way it just ratchets up the tension, just makes things more and more difficult for, for the hero. Great action sequences, an incredible villain. Uh, Alan Rickman as Hans Gruber, just outstanding. Real emotional stakes. Yep. Great yep. sets. Just yep. shot... Great lines. Bunch of great lines. Eminently quotable script. Just shot just so well. It's a great movie. I I I was not expecting to like it as much as I did. Um, but it's 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 a masterpiece. Well, it's a masterpiece in the same way something like Casablanca is a masterpiece, where it's like we have seen these elements before, but it is this is a movie that came in and just this has set the bar for action filmmaking. Like, it, like it, it, it's just a masterpiece of, a, of just a three-act script. Like, its setups and payoffs are all perfect. The characters are kind of sparse in their construction, mm-hmm. but, like, all of them seem to have, all of them have a history, and, and, and they feel like a part of this ripped world that we are creating out of this one tower in L.A., and there's again, there's this is another movie that's kind of about like the LA New York dynamic. Yeah, yeah, it's it's, right. it's a great New York versus LA movie. Like Bruce Willis, yeah. tough New York cop, comes to LA, and <laughs> no, that's just something, we love that in movies. We, we love the LA New York debate in movies. Like, yeah, I think that's that's why we love Annie Hall so much. Yeah. Ah, uh, I just what else can you say? It's uh, it's. It's fucking die hard. It's fucking die hard. All right. That closes the book on year one of the Hack Fraud show. Um, yeah, what a year. What a year. I think we've got a lot of great stuff still to come. <laughs> we've seen a lot of great mo- I, I think we've become better students because of this. I'd say so. Fucking die hard. Fucking die hard. Fucking die hard. Jesus. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Well, now I guess I can. Nice. What? Boogie fucking nights. <laughs> indeed. Indeed. Uh, I think, yeah, like, I, think, I think the only reason this didn't make my list was because, like, I think... It, it, I, I don't know. I guess I have a strange relationship with perfect movies. I kind of, like... It, it, I, I have a difficulty loving perfect movies. Yeah. 
I don't know. I, I, maybe that's just something. I, I guess I, I, I think a, a movie with some flaws is just more human. I don't know. Like, like, like it, Die Hard seems to be created by people that are inhuman. It is, it is too <laughs> perfect to be sullied by human hands. <laughs> and yeah, it's just like, it is a masterpiece. Yeah, I, I'm so glad it's, I, I'm so glad it's on here. Um, yeah, I think a, a diverse array of movies. Like, I was yeah. kind of worried that we are going to kind of overlap, but like, we I well, think all of us have some pretty unique lists. I think limiting it to stuff we you know we hadn't seen before kind of gave us each our each of our lists a unique yeah. flavor. Yeah. Well, well, if we didn't do that, we we just get a bunch of Wes Anderson and Miyazaki. No, and Charlie well, Coffey, yes. Yeah. No, yeah. I yeah. yeah. So, guys, <laughs> watch it. <laughs> okay, I want to start actually. So I didn't expect to watch any movies until I was sitting at my desk on Friday going. I'm Let's cool. watch a movie. <laughs> Let's watch a movie. So, I know uh, John's roommate, Alex, has definitely seen this, but he forgot about this. It is Fatih Akin's M. Yuli, which translates to In July. And boy, was this a romp. More so than I remember. <laughs> so, let me just give you the first scene. So, the first scene is that there's this guy driving a sketchy black car through the countryside, stuff from the sides of the road, gets goes to the trunk and sprays a dead body with like for a breeze or whatnot. And then <laughs> and then this character named Daniel, who's the who's the protagonist in this case, says, Can you help me? And then and the next thing you you know, the uh, su- the uh, suspicious guy for the life I just can't remember his name is like driving it in the car going, fuck, fuck, shit, I have two dead bodies now. I have two <laughs> dead bodies. This movie sounds delightful. Sounds like a romp. Yes. I want to recommend this for the podcast. <laughs> well, Garrett, I, I still need to have a place to put in my German expressionist films, and a German week might be the perfect place to do that. Okay, I, I'm i with you, but I don't think we can do it this next week because there's something uh, kind of timely that I would well just just hear me out i'll tell you about it well, in a I, I, I can put it on hold like it's it's ger- german expressionism can wait <laughs> it is in the past. okay so i guess that's all about i will say about this other than uh, this is a bit simple like la la land but this has much better characters <laughs> okay I think, yeah that, that sounds yeah that sounds really interesting like <laughs> the more you plug it and the more you describe it the more yeah that i'd be perfectly willing to do that I'm, I'm, I'm on board for that so I, I, I will refrain from more sorts of comments. Reed, is that your first recommendation? Just pure recommendation for this show? It might be. <laughs> oh. I'm so proud of you. Good, good, good job, Reed. You have come so far since the beginning of this podcast. Since <laughs> the beginning of this podcast, so it's more like, oh, fuck movies. And I, I mean, that's what? sort of how I am now, especially when you have number one is fucking Die Hard. <laughs> <laughs> You haven't seen Actually, Die Hard, Reed. That is true. Give it a chance. Give it a chance for you. John, what have, what have you, what's the one thing you've been watching? What's the one the one thing? I, well, um, I, I never watched this, but like my production, my little film production club here at OSU does like a little quiz at the beginning of each meeting, and if you win the quiz, you can win something. And I've won the quiz like three times. <laughs> Out of like like five meetings, which is kind of embarrassing, but and, and I want a movie, and I don't know what the make of it. Enter, Bruce the, Lee's dragon. Enter the dragon. <laughs> I don't. I, I remember like he gave it because like the guy he, the guy who made the quiz is a cute Bruce Lee fan. He's like, oh yeah, you're gonna love it. And I'm just I'm just staring at it like I'm staring at it like I'm staring at some ancient artifact <laughs> that I have no reference for. Who who directed and, that? Let me find out who directed it. Um, Robert Klaus. Okay, not who I was thinking of. Okay, I have no idea who. Uh, so that this is something that will be on my radar. I don't know if I'll ever watch it. <laughs> it exists. Um, the movie I actually watched was um, Ingmar Bergman's The Seventh Seal. Ooh, because that's a movie that I hear quite often, quite often about, and it seemed like something that was right up my alley. And it kind of was. Um, 
Set the story centers around like a knight who is returning from the Crusades. Like I, I think I think it's um like it begins on a beach with him and a sort of and I guess it's a servant. Um and like it, it, sort of, I guess it's implied that he died during the Crusades or, or something of that sort. Like I I'm not quite sure about the plot so much. It, it's it's very ethereal and mm -hmm. fantastical. But he plays chess with Death, who is just a a, a big, a tall white guy in a big in a big cloud, which seems cheap, but is actually kind of wonderful. Um, and like as the, this knight goes, this knight uh, sort of on and off is playing chess with Death, and he'll have like these like these philosophical conversations with Death, and like and you'll also get like just like. We pick up characters along the way and into different towns, and we get we, we talk about religion a lot. We talk about performance a lot. We talk about because it takes place in the Middle Ages around the Crusade. We talk mm -hmm. about Middle uh, Middle Ages culture a lot, and it's really fascinating. Like mm -hmm. it, it's I, I think granted like one of the a, a really huge Scandinavian idea because it's a Swedish film. Nick Marberg man is a Swedish filmmaker. One of the big s Swedish ideas is that of angst, angst, it, not not teenage angst, but like some. <laughs> it's defined insofar as that when one does not believe in God or one is not certain of an afterlife, there is this essential anxiety that one feels, and the movie is just all about that because like 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 the knight will keep saying like I want to believe in God, I want to be religious, but I cannot allow myself. I do not know what comes next. I have no certainty. And like how, and there's all like death is both like a is both a concept and a character within himself, and like death is just so is so great in it. Like he's not actually in it all that much, but he's just so fun and wily and, and oddly funny. Like the movies, the the, the, the whole movie is honestly like as, as as deep as it can get. Like it's still oddly funny. It still has time for a joke. There's still like a comedic suicide that comes at one point. <laughs> Like it, it's a it's a weird ethereal movie with lots of great ideas and a really fun ending. Well, not really a fun ending, but a really <laughs> fascinating ending. I really recommend. It. I want to go. I want to go out and, and watch more Igmar Bergman. Bergman. Yeah, I I haven't seen any Bergman movies. I'm I'm into that. Um, He's a really interesting film. I'd be I'd be open to that. Uh, so let me let me speed through uh, what I've been watching here. This week's History of International Film, we watched the Beatles film, A Hard Day's Night, which was delightful. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm kind of meaning to see that at some point. I just have never gotten around to it. Yeah, well, wa watch it. It's it's a rollicking good time. The Beatles are all playing themselves. They're hilarious. Uh, there's a great bit in it where um, there's this guy. I can't remember the actor's name. Uh, apparently he starred on like a famous British sitcom uh, and he plays Paul McCartney's grandfather and apparently like on the sitcom it was like a, a running thing where people would call him a dirty old man so it's a running gag in the movie people are constantly saying things like oh look at him he's very clean isn't he <laughs> which it, once you understand the joke which my professor was uh, kind enough to explain uh, that that just gets funnier every time. It's it's a lot of fun, and the music is great. Um, they play can't. Of course, the music is great. They play "Can't Buy Me Love" twice, which is fine because it's the best song on that album. Uh, it's great. Um, let's see what else. And then, I think this is it. Last night I watched a movie by the name of John Wick. Oh, you saw John? How is that? It's good. It's it's very interesting. It's. There's not a lot to it. The action scenes are great. It's it's pretty well put together. Um, you know, the story is very simple, almost kind of trite in a way, just just a little bit. But you know, I think you really feel it, and the action is outstanding. Uh, it's great. So is it like a simple story, but just with really great filmmaking? Yeah, yeah. I mean, even the filmmaking not it's not like at a super high level. It's just very entertaining. And the action scenes are like pretty inventive, uh, so I I recommend it. With the sequel coming out, I've been sort of like, well, should I go back? And yeah. See it? Should I go and see it? Yeah. Well, that's that was the reason I watched it because um, the sequel was uh, coming out. I I think I may see the sequel. Um, 
So, and then, oh, and then also I rewatched uh, Edgar Wright's Hot Fuzz, which uh, you, you may remember that I remarked that that was my least favorite of his movies. I got a new appreciation for it. it it's a lot better than I remembered. Uh, I think it's a lot of fun. John, I think you might actually enjoy it because it doesn't really have the man-child element of some of his other yeah. stuff. Because I think that's like my essential issue with Edgar Wright is that like the filmmaking is better than a typical like broad comedy, but like the stories he's telling and some of the humors he's using is is still of of a cloth with that. And I and I just don't generally like that kind. I, I don't I, I I don't need a billion stories about man children learning not to be man. Children, yeah, it it doesn't really have that same element. Um, okay. it's about something a little different. It's got some great um. Monty Python esque blood effects. Uh, <laughs> it's a it's a fun movie. And I, I, from what I've I, I've seen like little clips of Hot Fuzz, and I and I am curious about it. Yeah. So that's uh, that. Uh, that closes the book on this one. So uh, oh wait, I forgot one movie. Um, because it was really it's really fucking obscure. I saw a French movie. Um, uh, Les yeux sans visage. Eyes without a face. Um, oh, I've heard of that. Eyes without a face. Um, it's interesting. On it, well, the problem is like we saw like a terrible print of it. Uh. So like they're, they're, that's that's in um, the gore effects. Like it, it's 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 not a gory movie. There's not really that much about it. Not not that many gore effects. But like the gore that's in it is really good. Like there's like ro- this grotesque image of him cutting off a face. And like him removing it, and for 1959, it's honestly really impressive. Like it, it's a movie about like it's a movie about atmosphere and like building tension through like I, there's never like a jump scare in it. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the, the makeup's honestly pretty good. Like the like the central image of it, which is like this woman who has been deformed and she's wearing like this plain white face to hide her deformities. That's just like a genuine a genuinely creepy image. I don't know, like I, I found it kind of boring because I think like there are some interesting ideas in it. The issue is it, it's it's kind of um, I I don't know like it I it's it's I've heard it's very influential and it's influenced a lot of horror. So like I've seen a lot of the tropes in it before. Well, you you know who was influenced by that movie? Uh, who who? Edgar Wright. <laughs> I don't know. Like, it, it's not without its value. It's like it's it's well it's well shot. Some of the images are really nice. It's got like like, like the location of it is like you have this mad doctor who, whose daughter gets her face deformed, so he kidnaps young women and cuts off their faces to, to, to put on to make his daughter pretty. And there's like this massive mansion where he where he in the middle of on the outskirts of Paris where he keeps them hostage. That that's a fun concept. Um, I'm not too sure the movie exactly does it justice, but. It's usually influential. It, it it's got some interesting ideas. Like I, I don't think it's. I think I think it's I think it's it could be worth a watch. Like if you wanna, like especially if if you're a Red right fan, <laughs> maybe you'll see. Maybe you'll find some of this film. Maybe who knows? But like yeah, it's Perhaps. it's it's. it's I, I wasn't that oh I I wasn't that uh bowled over by it. But hey, it's a movie, a good movie. Finally, finish up this yes, yes. navel gazing week of the Hack Fraud Show. Yes, yeah, so for next week, um, I have something kind of topical. Um, the news came over the wire this past week that uh, the Japanese film auteur Seijin Suzuki uh, has passed away. And I saw one of his movies, uh, Branded to Kill, over the summer and kind of enjoyed it. And there's another one of his movies I've been meaning to watch. So, do we want to do some. Uh, Seijin Suzuki week. Will these be odd, batshit crazy Japanese films? I think so. I am fully on board with that. <laughs> Let's go. All right. What movies did you want to see? Because I have, I have no idea. I have no background with this film. Well, I, I think you guys should see Branded to Kill because that's kind of considered his his opus, uh, his magnum opus. And then um, there's another movie I want to watch called uh, Tokyo Drifter. Okay, so Branded to Kill and Tokyo Drifter. Yes, uh, they're both short. Branded to Kill is like 98 minutes. Tokyo Drifter is like 80-something. So good. nice nice kind of bite-sized movies this week. That's good. And I, I will... 
I think I, I'm going to do some research on this filmmaker because I, I, I like to always have like a kind of background yeah. with filmmakers and that's like, I think that's just a healthy thing to have. But I, I have no more to say. I have no background with this filmmaker. <laughs> and I will take weird, batshit, crazy Japanese movies any time of the week. <laughs> I think it, I think going with, the, I think starting out with crazy, batshit Japanese movies is a perfect way to start out uh, volume two. That's <laughs> how many volumes here. Um, the existing hack fraud show. I, right. I can't say acclaimed. I can't <laughs> say reviled. I can't even say notorious. I can only say the existing hack fraud show. I think that sums it up perfectly. <laughs> All right. Those of you who joined us, thank you for joining us. Thanks for listening, everybody. We really appreciate it. Uh, we, we love all 10 of you. Here's to year two, and uh, we'll see you next week. All right. Jesus. Jesus, indeed. Yeah, I stood up. I was getting restless. I'm sitting on tiles, so. Um, Dynamic cam! <laughs> oh, you're back. Okay. Um, okay. I, I thought there was a raccoon about ready to, to hiss on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs>